getting the level of glucose down, bringing the level of ketones up to where the millimolar concentration in the blood is about equal. And we call that a glucose ketone index of one. And the standard American diet has favors glucose to where it's like 25 to one. A clinical ketogenic diet is like maybe four to one, but a really restricted or really a modified ketogenic diet that I'm talking about that's really engineered for optimal therapeutic efficacy produces a glucose ketone index of about one. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I am your host, Ben Pakulski, as always, bringing you the world's brightest guests to ultimately solve this longevity challenge, help you live your greatest life in a body that you absolutely love. You know, my great passion in life has always been muscle building and movement. And in order for us to move effectively, people don't always think of all the potential influences on how well we move, how well we think, and ultimately how well we perform. Today's guest is pushing the envelope of human performance, not only from a physical perspective, but from a mental perspective. He resides in Tampa, Florida, a neighbor of mine and an incredibly brilliant human. He's doing work with NASA on how to really push the performance of the human system, period. We dive today into mitochondrial health, the two most important interventions for high performance who want to optimize health on a daily basis. We talk a little bit about metformin and its impact on mitochondrial health. We talk about ketones, and you may recognize this man's name as being the most famous name in the world of ketogenic dieting. Dr. Dominic D'Agostino joins me today to discuss at length uh, the use of ketones and its implication on performance, as well as Dom's research into uh, how to target cancer and ultimately environmental and psychological influences on things like cancer and high performance. Uh, I know that kind of sounds like there are two dichotomous things, but we do dive into some really interesting thoughts and, and things that Dom is studying now, ultimately that do tie very closely into what does high performance look like and how do we push that and ultimately how that actually implicates in obviously ketogenesis and cancer. So ladies and gents, I hope you enjoy the podcast. Today's podcast is brought to you by our friends over at Organifi, a longtime sponsor of the podcast because it works. We use it. Organifi Green is particularly useful for someone who isn't getting all their vegetables. Not only does it taste amazing, but you're getting organic, really, really high quality superfoods to ensure your body is getting the nutrients it needs to help your body get the minerals and ultimately feel great. If you want to be energized, if you want a a treat that truly tastes amazing, head over to Organifi.com slash muscle and get hooked up with 20% off for a limited time only. Organifi also has amazing products like a brand new collagen uh, product they call Glow. It tastes great. Um, They also have a great red product, which is ultimately beets and berries that ultimately can help cardiovascular function and erectile function. Guys, head over to Organifi.com slash muscle and get hooked up with 20% off. Today's podcast is also brought to you by our friends at Bioptimizers, magbreakthrough.com slash muscle intelligence to pick up the highest quality magnesium that exists anywhere. There's seven different types of magnesium in this one bottle. Why do you want seven different types of magnesium? Ultimately, each one has an influence on a different aspect of the system. So certain ones work on the nervous system, certain ones work for the muscles, certain work in the digestive tract and every other system. They also have different rates of absorption. So your body doesn't get bombarded with too much magnesium at once. It actually has almost like a slow dripping effect, which is very, very useful. Bioptimizers also has an incredible array of really, really high quality products that you guys have heard me talk about before from Masszymes to their patented P3OM probiotic, hydrochloric acid, Capex, so many amazing products that you guys can benefit from literally the entire line of their incredible products over at bioptimizers.com. That's B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S. And you can use the code MUSCLE10 to get hooked up on your next order. Ladies and gents, thank you very much for being here. I appreciate you guys listening to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast as we continue to get better and bigger and things are just moving in the right direction. So thank you guys all very much. I appreciate you. Enjoy the show with Dominic D'Agostino. We'll see you at the end. A big project that emerged out of 
NASA, and it was like 35, 40 people identified using multi-omics approaches like metabolomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, that mitochondrial dysfunction is the thing that needs to be focused on to enhance long duration space flight and to prevent space associated health risks. So that's sort of the literally the conclusion of that. And um, so a lot of a lot of work and a lot of research is being organized now to not only understand mitochondrial dysfunction as a consequence of like these extreme environments, but to develop biological countermeasures to mitigate mitochondrial dysfunction uh, in these extreme environments. And I've been working mostly with the Office of Navy Research and NAVC to understand this. And we have environmental chambers. I forget, Ben, if you've been into our lab before. I've ever, no, okay. No. Yeah. So we have a variety of different environmental chambers where we can simulate these extreme environments. And we, a part of what I did with my postdoctoral fellowship was developing atomic force microscopy, laser scanning confocal microscopy, where we can like look at the mitochondrial function under these extreme environments and look at reactive oxygen species production. We do electrophysiology in these uh, fluorescence imaging. So from our perspective, it's very basic science research. But over the years, you know, after we first connected, I was probably mostly all basic science. But then now we do clinical research. You know, some of that's being done at Duke and then Florida Medical Clinic. And then I became a subject myself in uh, extreme environment. I was part of NASA's extreme environment mission operations, which is lived underwater. And then my wife was on uh, mission 23, which was an all-female crew. Three of those aquanauts are on the International Space Station right now. That's yeah. Shell Lindgren. He was my commander. Uh, Samantha Cristoforetti, who's an Italian astronaut, and uh, Jess Watkins, who's a female, and I believe she was selected even for the Artemis mission, so she might be a future moonwalker. Wow. <laughs> so there is a, yeah, so we, we actually trained with, you know, astronauts and stuff and did a variety of different testing on them. We used like the Aura Ring, the Polar V800 to look at uh, heart rate variability. So a lot of what we were doing in the lab, looking at mitochondria, looking at cells and different rodent models, we've moved that into human research experiments in extreme environment. And one would be the space analog mission NEMO, NASA's extreme environment mission operation. So I'm involved in sort of moving that science into human application. And really with a focus now is understanding like how do these environments disrupt our performance, our cognitive performance, our physical performance, and probably most important, our overall health and longevity in these extreme environments, and then developing countermeasures, which could be exercise, it could be dietary, it could be nutraceutical, or it could be uh, pharmacological. There's pharmacological agents that mitigate muscle loss, you know, bone loss, and cognitive function. So kind of looking at all these different things. One thing that came to mind while you were saying all this is like, it almost feels like you're speeding up evolution. It's like you're making this, whoever these, these individuals are, you know, obviously higher performers, but, uh, you know, tell me if I'm wrong. The mitochondria obviously plays just a massive role in everything we do. If we can upregulate their ability to withstand huge amounts of stress, it almost feels like it, it's like making them a more powerful version of the species. Yeah, these extreme environments are essentially elevated or uh, rapid aging. <laughs> so, and that's, you know, the mitochondria, we, from our high school biology, we know them as the powerhouse of the, of the cell, right? But they do so much more. <laughs> I mean, you know, I just finished teaching neuropharmacology and neurotransmitters are made in the mitochondria, you know, oh. monoamine oxidase, for example, you know, is an enzyme, you know, made in the mitochondria. So the mitochondria are not only generate ATP that the cells use, but they are very powerful signaling molecules and they communicate back and forth with the nucleus of the cell. You know, we always say the mitochondria call the shots. <laughs> so even in the context of things like cancer, when the mitochondria become damaged, ATP levels fall. And then through a retrograde response, that basically cell tells the nucleus that there's an energetic crisis. And that begins to cascade to, nor to transform a normal cell into a cancer cell, which upregulates things like glycolysis and sugar metabolism. And that's, you know, eventually the, the transformed cell has a what we call a Warburg phenotype, which is damaged mitochondrial respiration and compensatory fermentation. So the cells ferment 
and they're, they're using fermenting fuels like glucose and glutamine for their survival. A similar thing is happen, happening in a very protracted way in the context of the space environment, or even an undersea environment where there's a higher concentration of oxygen and even a higher concentration of CO2. The partial pressure of CO2 in International Space Station is similar to a submarine where it's like two to 8,000 parts per million of CO2, and this is causing redox stress. This is something that we study in the lab, how it affects, you know, neural control, how it affects brain function, physical function, the gut microbiome, our gut permeability, this high CO2 tends to damage the tight, what are called the tight junctions in the gut. Mm. And that makes the gut leaky. We have the same tight junctions on the blood brain barrier. So it also makes the brain kind of leaky and contributes to inflammation. You know, when I was in these extreme environments, I measured HSCRP, which is kind of like a global you know, and, and other measures, but I measure HR, HSCRP probably a hundred times through in the lab and different kits. And it's always super low, like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, unless I have some kind of infection. And these extreme environments shoot it up almost to like where I have an infection. So we know that over time, you know, we have to figure out how it's doing it, why it's doing it and developing countermeasures against it. But the countermeasures that are being developed, much like many military projects, those technologies can be applied to the everyday person, right? So yep. for for not only performance enhancement, but just general health. And so much, there's so much value in there. So many questions I have to ask. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned uh, a Warburg cell. Like, can you explain what that is? You said there's, there's like a Warburg phenotype. Was it a phenotype or gen like an expression, I guess? More than 10 years ago now, we started doing research on cancer metabolism. Yep. And we're basically under the impression after observing cancer cell mitochondria in different microscopy setups that the cancer cell mitochondria were spitting out massive amounts of oxygen free radicals, superoxide, right? I didn't know why this was happening because I didn't know a whole lot about cancer at the time, but come to find out that the metabolism of cancer is significantly different than the metabolism of healthy cells. Whereas a cancer cell metabolism essentially de-differentiates from deriving the majority of its energy from mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation you know, the electron transport chain, there's a gradual progression of decreased mitochondrial function and mitochondrial number to relying more on glycolytic glutaminolysis metabolism, where you're deriving energy from glucose. So cancer cells in many ways have especially more aggressive tumors that are metastasizing and growing very fast. They have super high rates of glucose metabolism, 100 to 200 times higher. And as a consequence of that, we can image cancer tumors with a fluorodeoxyglucose PET scan or FTG PET scan. So the tumor lights up very intensely. And what you're imaging there is a hyper absorption and metabolism of glucose relative to driven by glycolysis relative to mitochondrial function which in mitochondria use fatty acids and ketones for fuel. So that's sort of falls into this idea that is true to some extent is that if you're in a state of low glucose consumption, low glucose, low blood glucose, low insulin, low IGF-1, uh, which would be facilitated with a ketogenic diet and high fatty acid oxidation, high ketones, that would basically marginalize the growth and development of the tumor. So going off a bit of a tangent, but the Warburg effect, a simple, if I had to have a one sentence description of the Warburg phenotype, it would be damaged mitochondrial respiration leads to compensatory fermentation. So we know that the DNA have, of our cells have very robust repair mechanisms. If we're exposed to environmental toxins, if we're exposed to like in space radiation, if we're exposed to viruses tend to damage the mitochondria to a greater extent than the nuclear DNA. So progressive damage to oxidative damage, inflammation, viruses, cancer, radiation, all these things tend to damage the mitochondria and the mitochondrial DNA more than the nuclear DNA. 
And essentially what happens, you have progressive mitochondrial dysfunction and the DNA repair mechanisms of the mitochondria are not as robust as the nucleus. And then the nucleus, the brain of the cell, is really sensing that there's inflammation and an energetic crisis, and that kicks on a survival mechanism. And some of those survival genes are called oncogenes. And oncogenes, when they are expressed, starts the transformation of a normal healthy cell that would have healthy, robust mitochondria. That mitochondrial damage starts to transform a normal healthy cell into a precancerous cell. And then progressive damage to the mitochondria and activation of certain oncogenes can push the cell to the point of no return. And in some cases, that cell dies. uh, But in some cases, if that cell goes on to live on, the oncogenes endow the cell with what we call the hallmarks of cancer, which is unbridled proliferation, inflammation, metastasis, you know, aberrant cellular metabolism. So that cell transforms to what is called a Warburg phenotype, where it's deriving the large majority of its energy from glucose and to some extent glutamine. And then that phenotype, a consequence of that is that it directs the glucose to synthesizing biomolecules, like more membrane. So as the cell divides, it needs to shuttle a lot of the biomolecules to basically produce uh, more carbon molecules for the expanding biomass of the tumor. So you're fermenting, and then a lot of that glucose goes into making more membrane, more DNA, more proteins, and things like that. So, uh, and some people think that the Warburg effect, the benefit of that for the cancer cell is directing uh, carbons to biosynthesis, and, but it also allows the tumor to basically live in a hypoxic environment, where if you're deriving energy from glycolysis, then you're not as dependent upon oxygen and oxi- you know, oxidative phosphorylation. So I became very interested in why this happens and after it happens, after the fact, you have a Warburg phenotype, how can we change the metabolism of our physiology and the cell environment to limit the growth and target the Warburg phenotype to kill that, that particular cell type? And that has become a big thrust of an unexpected direction of our research in 2009 or 10. I started studying that. So is that where we kind of shift now the conversation into countermeasures? Like how do we counteract these? Obviously, there's other things that you're looking for countermeasures for, but specific to the Warburg phenotype, countermeasures, obviously starting with ketogenic diet, but I'd love to hear what other things you guys are exploring. Yeah. And, and you know, this does tie in, we started talking about space and the yeah. consequence of living in space. It's like accelerated aging. And we now know that space targets the mitochondria. You have mitochondrial dysfunction. You know, a, a big problem is potential problem is basically getting cancer while you're on a mission, a multi-year mission going to to Mars, right? So, and radiation is probably the most potent stimulator of oncogenesis of of forming cancer. So uh, space radiation is called galactic cosmic radiation. It's a bit different. It's like uh, you got solar particle events and uh, basically charged ions kind of going through your body, which can make nicks in your DNA, mitochondria and nuclear DNA, and double-stranded nicks create mutations, and then, uh, but it's really impacting the mitochondria. So getting back to your question, you know, if you have cancer, and this would apply mostly to not so much to leukemia and different forms of uh, lymphoma, but solid tumors, we're mostly interested in like brain cancer is what we have kind of started focusing on. There are different strategies that you could use. You know, I think of the ketogenic diet, caloric restriction and ketogenic diet and diets that restrict fermentable fuels will decrease, will take the foot off the gas pedal, so to speak, of cancer growth. So it'll slow it down. It will not cure cancer. I don't care what anybody says. Some some people look at different animal studies and, and say and think that different dietary patterns, whether it be the Budwig diet or the vegan diet or this diet, it would be the cure for cancer. And that's not the case. But these nutritional therapies, and that's what they are, medical therapies, can can be used as a standalone therapy, you know, if cancer has been very advanced or if standard care is not working. But we're very interested in using a modified ketogenic diet that I call like a protein sparing modified ketogenic diet that's supplemented. (laughs) 
So it's a ketogenic diet that has higher amounts of protein to mitigate cancer cachexia. It's modified with the types of fatty acids that comprise. A ketogenic diet is much higher percentage-wise in fat. So we want to use you know, omega-3 fatty acids, less omega-6s. We want to use medium chain triglycerides because they're more ketogenic. And we also want to incorporate different types of prebiotic fiber into the ketogenic diet to preserve and sustain the gut microbiome because that's really important for barrier function in the gut. It also makes uh, short chain fatty acids like butyrate, which can be important. So you have higher protein, almost double the amount of protein. A clinical ketogenic diet for epilepsy is like 10% protein. So we want to boost that up to 20, even upwards to 25, 30. And then a fatty acid composition that's not only highly anti-inflammatory, but also very ketogenic, like uh, caprylic triglyceride, for example, it's rich in that. And then prebiotic fiber that can preserve and, and maintain the gut microbiome. Is that a supplemental source, Dom, or is that from a specific food for the prebiotic fibers? Uh, yeah, it could be a mix of different plant-based, you know, phytonutrients. There's different fibers on, on the market, obviously, like different prebiotic fibers, but or they could be plant-based from like artichoke or greens or something like that. You know, in our lab setting, we have to rely on whatever the company has <laughs> For different fermentable fuels. So we usually use a common, like some soluble and insoluble fiber mix. But when you're formulating like a diet for someone, you want to have a diversity, mostly like things that are very, like greens. So very dark greens, dark leafy greens, you know, broccoli, of course, is good, uh, asparagus, things like that, things that are just mostly water and fiber. But then a lot of, a big part of what we do is actually developing ketone supplements that do two things really. They elevate ketones in the blood and ketones have, you know, they provide energy to healthy cells, but not so much cancer cells. They have epigenetic effects. They have anti-inflammatory signaling effects. They preserve and can protect the brain from radiation if someone's undergoing like radiation therapy for a brain tumor. And they have anti-catabolic effects. So uh, we've published on this showing that and that may be like from an evolutionary perspective, when you're fasting, you start mobilizing fatty acids for fuel. The fats do not cross the blood brain barrier. So the liver converts the fats to ketones. And then the ketones can preserve your CNS function. And many people become more lucid, like in a fasted state. And then the ketone bodies actually prevent the breakdown of skeletal muscle. They actually have anti-catabolic effects. So if we're fasting, if we, we did not make ketones, first of all, we would not have brain energy. <laughs> Our brain energy would, would tank, right? But the beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate prevent alanine from breaking down. A major gluconeogenic amino acid in skeletal muscle is alanine. So we'll start breaking down skeletal muscle to liberate gluconeogenic amino acids to preserve our normal, there's very powerful homeostatic mechanisms that maintain blood glucose. And part of that process is breaking down skeletal muscle to get access to it. But if ketones are elevated, then that has a tremendous anti-catabolic effect by virtue of preventing uh, the breakdown of skeletal muscle, by preventing uh, gluconeogenesis and also to some extent glycogenolysis. So supplementing ketones to that diet that I described, a protein sparing modified supplemented ketogenic diet with ketones would be a way to keep glucose low and elevate, yeah, glucose low and elevate ketones to where they're at, at about in millimolar concentrations at about three or 3.5. So glucose is usually, you know, five, six, seven, eight in some people in America, millimolar. We're talking millimolar concentrations, which is like a you know, 100 milligrams per deciliter in US units, depending upon the units. But essentially what you're doing is getting the level of glucose down, bringing the level of ketones up to where the millimolar concentration in the blood is about equal. And we call that a glucose ketone index of one. And the standard American diet has favors glucose to where it's like 25 to one. A clinical ketogenic diet is like maybe four to one, but a really restrict or really a modified ketogenic diet that I'm talking about that's really engineered for optimal therapeutic efficacy produces a glucose ketone index of about one. You can't get rid of glucose altogether. It's not like your body's switching to fats and ketones. Your glucose will stay, will stay there. But this has a profound effect on the growth of 
cancer has a profound effect on brain function, on preventing seizures. So that becomes the foundation then to apply different different uh, modalities like hyperbaric oxygen therapy, for example. It basically, when you restrict glucose availability to the tumor, that inhibits the endogenous antioxidant mechanisms within the tumor. So when you hyperoxygenate the tumor, when you reverse tumor hypoxia and hyperoxygenate it, the tumor produces an overproduction of oxygen free radicals and can kill it from the inside out. Mm. So tumors usually they grow really fast and the oxygen supply, the vascular supply cannot keep up with the growth. So you have less vascular, so the tumor becomes hypoxic in the core. But with hyperbaric oxygen therapy, you increase the oxygenation in the body independent of hemoglobin. So hemoglobin's already saturated, right. you know, right? So it's like 90, 100% hemoglobin. But the oxygen is in is dissolved into the plasma, so it's independent. Your your body's carrying the oxygen, and it's dissolved in in the plasma and the liquid component. So it can get all into the nooks and crannies of the tumor, right? Mm-hmm. And then that, if you you know give damaged mitochondria an abundance of oxygen, it'll take that oxygen and make oxygen free radicals and you can kill the tumor from the inside out. And that's actually most radiation and most chemotherapy drug kill tumors through an oxidative stress mechanism. Hmm. If you apply hyperbaric oxygen in the context of a ketogenic diet that produces a a glucose ketone index or a GKI of one, then that makes the tumor more vulnerable to this modality that I'm talking about, which is hyperbaric oxygen. It would also make the tumor more vulnerable to radiation and chemo, so the standard of care and also immune-based therapies. So you have, you know, ketogenic diet that can slow tumor growth. It's not going to reverse it in most cases. Some cases it will. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And then you have a whole toolbox of different drugs that we can talk about. So we have focused on metformin as a drug. That seems to work pretty well. Can I just clarify one thing before you talk about the, the other drugs? You said that the glucose ketone ratio has to be one. You, you said it was a four to one ratio on a typical ketogenic diet. Is that four to one glucose to ketone? So a normal ketogenic diet won't get down to that one to one ratio? Yeah. Okay. Good question. So with a, like a modified ketogenic diet, that's like say 75% fat, 25% protein, and like, you know, 5% of like non-glycemic carbohydrates, if I follow that, which is sort of similar to what I follow, some days it's more protein, I will have a beta hydroxybutyrate level, a ketone level of about one millimolar, right? And then my glucose usually stays about four millimolar, which is like, you know, 80, 85 ish. Yep. And so that in millimolar ratio, that would be about a glucose ketone index of four, right? So yep. if the glucose over the ketones, beta hydroxybutyrate right. in millimolar concentrations. You got to bring the ketones up. Yeah. So if you take that diet I just described and you calorie restrict it, and then you add like ketogenic fats like MCT oils, and then you add like ketone salts ketone esters or something, then you can elevate the ketones. And an interesting effect of ketogenic agents is that it also lowers blood glucose. So you have a lowering glucose and an elevation of ketones. And in that context, insulin still stays very low and it's very suppressed in that low end of normal. In that context, uh, it really marginalizes, it really impacts cancer growth. Pretty much all cancers are dependent upon, you know, insulin, IGF-1, glycolysis. I mean, that basically underlies the, the imaging technology that's the gold standard, FGG-PET. So we use that technology to image tumors and also to show how aggressive the cancer is, but we don't historically use that technology use that that knowledge to target it with uh, different metabolic drugs until, I mean, I was talking about this 10 years ago, until the last 10 years. <laughs> so now we have cancer conferences all over like cancer metabolism where drugs like metformin, drugs that are targeting like PI3 kinase inhibitors, Luke Cantley has been working on that. Intensive, those PI3 kinase inhibitors were primarily in the context of a ketogenic diet. Because if you take a PI3 kinase inhibitor, you get a counter-regulatory effect of increasing insulin. But if you couple it with a ketogenic diet, that will bring insulin back down and basically unleash the therapeutic effects of that PI3 kinase inhibitor. And then there's 2-deoxyglucose. We've been working with that for years. Lonidamine, it inhibits hexakinase, which is a glycolytic uh, enzyme. 
basically the cells need that to to make energy from glycolysis you know and and there's different like plant-based compounds too that like egcg which could help bring down glutamine it has some effects so there's different plant-based compounds that i'm super interested in it's just hard to get funding for those types of research but personally i'm very interested in researching many of the more natural plant-based constant. Berberine is an example, or dihydroberberine is is an example of something similar to metformin that's more of a natural. Amazing information, Dom. So a uh, few things that come in there. One question that just popped up into my mind, is there any negative effect to taking ketone supplements too often? So obviously being in a ketogenic diet is incredibly valuable. You know, I don't know if you do it always, or is it cyclical? I think the last time we spoke, you said you were kind of cyclical. Sometimes in the summertime, you'd, you'd have some more carbohydrates. I'm curious if that's still the case. And I've heard some some conversations around like some potential acidifying effects of taking ketone supplements too often. I'm not sure if that's true. Yeah. Well, good question. So, you know, it's summertime and we have some mango trees. We got tons of avocado trees. So sometimes, you know, I'll even a few weeks ago grabbed a watermelon off the local thing and ate that. Surprisingly, it didn't really elevate my glucose too much. But yeah, I incorporate like seasonally some, you know, more vegetables and more fruits in, in the summer and tend to eat a little more ketogenic in the winter. And my protein on some days is, is higher. Some days I'm, you know, above 200 or, but usually fluctuate about 150 grams protein a day, which is probably not that much from your world. I mean, back when- the same. I was 20, 25 years old. I was getting four to 500 grams of protein a day, like legitimately eating pounds of steak and washing it down with metrics. Remember metrics right. with HMB, all that, that supplement. Yeah. Man, I still tell stories about the first time we met when you were, you were yeah. deadlifting like a machine at uh, Powerhouse <laughs> in Tampa. Oh, Powerhouse North. Yeah. yeah. That was the place, man. Yeah. I yeah, remember you're like, you were, I haven't eaten in three days and I'm deadlifting 600 pounds for sets of 10. <laughs> What's going on? Yeah. I remember first seeing you at the Tampa Pro and yep. all I could really see was your legs. And I was like, who the hell is this guy? I didn't even like know of you. Just like came out of nowhere and just started like crushing the competition. Yeah. Yeah. Blowing like, people off stage with the legs. Yeah. And, her, and then your back came out like a year or two after that. You started just really nailing, I guess, what you focus were on the weak points. And yeah. and that's, I think, what really set you apart. I think you were like, and you've talked about this too, is just really focusing on what is not optimal and just balancing mm -hmm. everything out. Yep. So it's like the puzzle pieces, right? You're just like, hey, what's missing and how do I figure out how to how to fill this this you know hole? Yeah. Instead of just focusing on blowing out your legs more <laughs> and doing that, you're just yeah, firing to see you in powerhouse. I remember at the time it was just uh Nate Wansley was there. Do you remember Nate? Of course, and, yeah. like, Lane, you know, Lane was training there. I don't know. There's just a lot. It was just a full of energy. I don't know what it's like now. I haven't, I've been training on my farm gym. So I have, uh, Man, I see, I see you got the farm. cows in the background. You're deadlifting yeah, with the cows. Yeah. That's so great. Yeah. That, yeah. That's awesome. Um, so that's my lifestyle now, but yeah. So this, this idea of basically a multifaceted approach, which could be applied for the metabolic management of cancer. So you have a dietary therapy that produces a glucose ketone index of one. So this is sort of this idea that we presented. It's being used now in some clinical trials. And then hyperbaric oxygen therapy. I still think there's a lot of potential in that. It's underutilized. Is there a certain depth, Dom? Is like, as you hear like the hard versus the soft yeah. uh, chambers, do you need to go the, like as, as deep as possible? Good question. I think it needs to be to some extent titrated to the patient. Because if you have a patient that has like a brain tumor, they could be more susceptible to oxygen toxicity seizures. So you have to like go in at like maybe 1.3 to 1.5, do a couple sessions. But and we did lower doses of oxygen in our animal models and just didn't see a big effect. And then we coupled it with the ketogenic diet and saw the trend with like 1.5. But, you know, our sample size was only, I think, eight or 10. And we realized, hey, if we had 20 animals, we would probably have statistical significance here. But it's not as robust as using like 2.5 or three atmospheres of oxygen, which would require a hard shell uh, hyperbaric chamber. Keep in mind that I am talking about animal model studies for this too. So, um, you know, in humans, it could be a bit different, but you know, in, in comparing and contrasting low dose oxygen with high dose oxygen, the tumor suppressing effects of high dose oxygen was much more. And it's within the safe limits of hyperbaric medicine. So, you know, that's used for wound healing. And we didn't actually even do it every, every day. We did it Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and we had a break. Like Tuesday would be a rest day. 
and there would be adaptive processes. And then we'd hit it again uh, Wednesday and then hit it again Friday. So it'd be three days a week, which is more feasible to do for the patient too. Uh, maybe an odd question, Don, but would something like that be useful in case of like prophylaxis? If I wanted to just like, you know, rid myself of cancer cells and like just ensure that I didn't get it long term, would, would doing, you know, a, a hyperbaric a couple of times, maybe uh, in a week or a month uh, with this glucose to ketone ratios of being at one be useful for just people who are aspiring for optimal health? I think that's a great question. And these are some of the questions that we have and would love to get funding for for doing. The government, you know, the NCI and, and the NIH don't they don't really fund research on cancer prevention, which I think would be really important because there are animal model systems that we know that this particular animal model will have, you know, 50% of the animals will have spontaneous tumors by the time it reaches 200 days of age, right? And then there's Basically, you could take animals and give them, you know, UV radiation to produce skin cancer. You could take, you could give them certain environmental toxins that we know produce spontaneous tumors. So if we were to take these various animal models and then start prophylactically putting them on ketogenic diets, giving them hyperbaric oxygen therapy or different plant-based compounds, and then looking at spontaneous tumor formation over the life of the animal, that would have tremendous you know, translatable consequences, <laughs> actionable things that, but this type of research is, is not being done. And we think it's kind of important. So we hope to do some of those studies in the future. We do know that like certain things like caloric restriction, if you have animals and calorically restrict them, that, you know, it'll knock down spontaneous tumor production by like 70%, you know, but animals tend to just overeat when you give them ad libitum food anyway. So, uh, well, humans do the same thing. So. Uh, <laughs> So it would probably, you know, there'd be some translatability there. Uh, but to answer your question, which is a very good one, yeah, I do think that if someone was to put themselves into therapeutic ketosis and then use, you know, buy like 10 sessions of hyperbaric oxygen therapy or 30 sessions and use that over the course of a month and do that like maybe once a year, I think that they would be basically they're stimulating stem cells too. So we know hyperbaric oxygen therapy stimulates the production and the release of stem cells. So this could be helpful for your joints, for your brains, for your muscles, uh, help you re re recovery and things like that. And it could be a prophylactic way to suppress cancer or to purge the body or kill precancerous cells that you have. Thomas, as a guy who I know who takes his training very, very seriously, I'm curious your personal feedback or personal insights about metformin because you know, we see the benefit in metformin, perspectively from longevity perspective, but there's also this conversation around it maybe taking away from, from mitochondrial effectiveness or maybe make your mitochondria less effective. I don't know mechanistically what's happening. I assume you do. But I'm curious, you know, just in general, would you say metformin is a good therapy for most people looking to ultimately optimize mitochondrial function and, you know, increase longevity in the simplest format? Yeah, actually, we published a paper on the effects of mitochondria, and this is before it was common knowledge. But what we observed with metformin is that it was disrupting uh, mitochondrial function, and it was causing an, an, a higher production of oxygen-free radicals and right. disrupting, you know, so. And now that's more like common knowledge. We only saw a very mild, you know reduction in glucose. And even some of the signaling pathways were not really uh, affected that much. But what we did see was the mitochondria was causing mitochondrial stress. And that's part of what it, you know, probably what it does maybe therapeutically too. So to answer your question, I experimented with metformin. And if I'm taking two grams or more a day, and I'm doing like sets of squats or really high intensity workouts, I started to become dizzy. And actually, uh, it, it just did not feel well. If I tested my blood with a lactate meter, my lactate was higher when I do the same amount of work if I'm taking metformin. So to me, if your body's pumping out lactate, that's a sign that your mitochondria are not keeping up with the energy demands and you're shifting some of your energy pathways to more glycolysis. So and essentially, that's the Warburg effect. So the Warburg effect is the cells are pumping out lactate and still consuming oxygen. So the mitochondria are respiring and using oxygen, but it's like a pseudo respiration because it's not coupled to ATP production. But whenever cells are pumping out lactate, that's a sign that the mitochondria are not efficient and that there's mitochondrial inefficiency. So this is what I observed when I took metformin. It also tends to impact, and we have the livers from our 
metformin study, but I think it, it impacts liver redox mechanisms in a way that when you work out, you generate lactate, the lactate goes back to the liver and through the quarry cycle, that lactate then becomes glucose again. So metformin impairs uh, the quarry cycle and other, it shifts the redox state of the liver in a way that can decrease this quarry cycle. And a side effect of metformin is lactic acidosis, right? So that's like a a well-known side effect of that. And I think it's doing that because it's essentially toxic to the liver. (laughs) The liver is like shock full of mitochondria. So when we used to isolate mitochondria to, to study them, we would the easiest thing to do is actually to take the liver because it's just like chock full of mitochondria. And then you do a procedure where you isolate the mitochondria and study it. To answer your question, I I really feel that metformin's not a good idea. Perhaps if you're going to use it in a longevity uh, scenario, you would do like, you know, ketogenic diet, hyperbaric oxygen therapy for two to four weeks, and then use metformin during that stack these different modalities together and produce a deep state of low glucose, low insulin, high ketones. That's basically going to be a huge hit to any precancerous cells or cancer you have in your body and could potentially purge cancer out. And then, uh, I mean, this is all theoretical, right? But I mean, the basic science is there. The physiology is there. Uh, There's a lot of, there will probably never be a clinical trial that does this. Although animal model studies I'm 100% sure would basically demonstrate that if you have animals that are susceptible to spontaneous tumors and you were to give them a modified, you know, ketogenic diet supplement that I talk about, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and you give them some of these cancer specific metabolic drugs, if you were to do that in a cohort of animals, those animals are clearly going to have less cancer. And, you know, would that translate to humans? Probably. Um, You said there's a few things that we know of that are environmental that cause spontaneous cancer. I'm curious if you would mind sharing those, because that sounds like an interesting topic. Yeah. Well, you know, there's, we could kind of go down the rabbit hole of different insecticides and herbicides and uh, pesticides, and then also just our psychological state, stress. You know, stress impacts our immune system and immune surveillance prevents us from getting cancer, you know, immune surveillance in the body, having a strong immune system will cause the body to recognize a cancerous or precancerous cell and then attack it in a way that the cancer never, it's a non-event, right? So we're always cancering in our body. Our body's always producing precancerous cells and cancer cells, but our immune system keeps everything in check. Uh, if we were to take, if we have certain lifestyle things like stress, physical stress, psychological stress, or environmental toxins, and these, I mean, simplest would be like alcohol, you know, impacts the immune system too much. Well, one glass a day, maybe two glasses a day could be beneficial. High doses of, you know, high amounts of sugar can impair that causes a dysglycemia, glycemic dysregulation. I wear a continuous glucose monitor as part of a, a study with continuous glucose monitoring and seeing how we can optimize certain metabolic parameters and non-diabetics. So I really think that's the future to using different wearables. But I mean, there's, there's things in the environment that are pervasive, like benzenes and, you know, these things have been shown to cause leukemias and lymphomas. I mean, that's clear. If someone has acute myeloid leukemia, like AML or CML, it's the first thing you start looking at is environmental toxins because these things are linked uh, with that. Brain cancers like glioblastomas and other forms of cancers, they have not been able to conclusively link that to different environmental toxins, but it's likely that. And then there's epigenetic and genetic factors that when we're exposed to these things, some people can mitigate it and detoxify. The liver may, through first pass metabolism and different phases of detoxification, glucuronidation, for example, in the liver, which is a detoxification pathway, that's impaired in a lot of people. And some people are poor methylators and they lack, you know, they have the various genes that can disrupt endogenous antioxidant systems where it causes more oxidative stress in, in tissues when we have, we're exposed to different chemicals. But there's almost too many chemicals in the environment to name, but some of them are agricultural chemicals. And another thing I think, which is important to bring attention to is infections that people have. And that could be like, you know, Lyme disease could be one, but also uh, Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, various viruses that we have, the herpes simplex virus, 
2 probably makes us susceptible. We know HIV makes us susceptible to different forms of cancer. So these viruses impair the immune system in a way that could make us more susceptible to cancer later on. The shingles, you know, virus, that's why it's probably important later on in life if you have shingles to get a uh, shingles vaccination. You know, I think if you're over 50, you can get that. So these viruses that we chronically have continue like stress our immune system out so that if we have psychological stress or physical stress, then our immune system keeps it under constraints when we're healthy, but when we're under physical or psychological stress, then these viruses basically start replicating, you have viral shedding, and then you have, you know, it starts off with like a headache, and then you have maybe a shingles outbreak or a herpes simplex outbreak or Epstein-Barr virus if you have mono. These viruses, I, I really think, can be tied to different cancers. You know, I think we know that at this point. Michael Bishop, I think, won the Nobel Prize and demonstrated that viruses cause cancer. So that was like a big finding years ago. Super interesting. A lot of questions out of that. Some of these people that you work with may be poor methylators. How much are you guys looking at genetics as far as, so there's, I mean, when you're looking, when you work with these astronauts and people in the cosmonaut program, like, are you, are you able to look at variable, uh, variables of genetics and, you know, how does that influencing your ability to make decisions on who actually goes on these missions? Is that something you guys are looking into? That's a loaded question because for reasons, if you know someone's genetic susceptibility to certain diseases or spaceflight, right? So you could exclude people. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, government organizations like NASA are all about being inclusive, you know, you and not excluding people. So I didn't, I came to realize this when we started, we had a number of IRB protocols that had to go through NASA. And even when you do like gut microbiome, that's like you're doing genetics of an astronaut and there's a, a whole nother committee that's involved with that, like ethically, hey, are you going to identify some kind of genetic predictor that could exclude someone perhaps now or in the future from spaceflight. So there's a, there's a lot of politics around that and a lot of ethics around if that's ethical to do, kind of to basically select people based upon their genetics. But I, it's super you can at least important. give them the option and say, hey, like you do this, you're predisposed to this. Are you okay with that? That sounds like a, maybe a logical approach, right? Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, studying this in, in the context of like space, and I just bring it up because uh, it's kind of like a touchy subject, like doing genetics on on astronauts because you could potentially be excluding people, you know, just like with healthcare and health. Yep. You know, healthcare insurance companies having access to your genetic information and then basically charging you a higher premium or excluding you from being, you know, covered altogether right. can, can kind of be an issue. But you bring up a really important issue. And I totally, I really do think that understanding genetic susceptibility to, you know, Type 2 diabetes is, is like a big one, right? I mean, that's like the low-hanging fruit. If we know there's certain families where like everybody over the age of 50 has type 2 diabetes and then their comorbidities are basically causing insurance companies to dump a ton of money into the management of their diabetes. And also, all you know, you're more susceptible to dementia, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. They're the three things that kill people, right? So you're astronomically higher rates of of the three main things that kill people if you have type 2 diabetes. And there's a genetic component there. There's an environmental component. But I think that is the future. And it could lead to expanding nutrigenomics, expanding like cellular detoxification because people have different... I would actually recommend having Dr. Sheila Dean on. She is an expert in nutrigenomics and cellular detoxification pathways. So we're talking about detox, not from like the pseudoscience point of view, like right. she has deep information working. She does tons of labs with like uh, Genova Diagnostics and everything. And she's a, a good friend and collaborator of mine, far more insights into knowing what tests to do on people to identify genetic susceptibility to different dietary patterns or different lifestyle patterns. So yeah, there's a lot. We're doing a little bit of that now, but it's not you know a huge thrust of what we're doing. Super interesting. Thank you. I'll definitely reach out. So coming back to what we talked about right in the beginning is these, ultimately what I'm viewing as high performance interventions, right? So if these, these astronauts and people like yourself are saying, hey, we're going in outer space, we're exposing ourselves to radiation and oxidative stress, and therefore, we must make our mitochondria more robust. What are some of the things you do, or maybe that you could talk about what the astronauts are doing, uh, that are going to allow them to become more anti-fragile, more resilient to these you know, challenges they're facing? Because ultimately, you know, what, what can I do on a daily basis? What can I extrapolate from that to go, hey, 
this is how we're going to make these mitochondria more robust. Yeah, man. Well, you're like a walking example of doing that in the real world function. You so totally lay, you're like listed on my diet there when you're on the, the, the protein spraying um, modified keto diet. I was like, yeah, that's yeah. pretty much exactly what my life looks like. Yeah. 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 I mean, we all, we talk a lot about biomarkers, you know, getting certain biomarkers in check. Right. And, and that's important. And we can have that conversation, but I think like top of the list and you'll appreciate this, the biggest biomarker for metabolic health and wellness and longevity is basically your body composition. It's not, maybe it's not politically correct to talk about it, but yeah, just being fat and being, you know, having a uh, glycemic you know, high glucose, you know, we could talk about that, but basically having a lot of lean body mass and having low body fat, that's probably the top of the chain. If we're going to talk about health and longevity and brain function. And if you feel good about your body, that's going to be better psychology, better physiology altogether. So, you know, doctors don't really talk about that, but I think body composition is like the number one biomarker. And then there's things, you know, blood pressure, you know, what your blood pressure is kind of like a silent killer non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is, uh, I didn't realize this until we started our clinical trial and we excluded everybody that was obese. We excluded everybody that had type 2 diabetes, but we did, we looked for hepatic steatosis and come to find out 80% of the people that are in our trial, which are normal people, you know, non-diabetic, non-obese, they had uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Wow. And this quickly reversed with a carbohydrate restricted diet. But, you know, we didn't, we didn't know that was going to be the case. Uh, but that was, this will, and it doesn't show up in blood work. It'll start to show up. You'll have a creeping up of the ALT, AST, not so much, but the ALT, the liver enzyme will start creeping up and that'll be an early, but usually once that gets out of range, the damage has been done and you have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and then scarring in the liver by the time your ALT gets, gets high, persistently high. And then that's not going to go back. Some of it can go back, but it's, you know, it's with low carb diets, you can reverse some of the effects of non-alcoholic fatty liver. So, but to, you know, get routine blood work, your C CBC, CMP, and I wear a continuous glucose monitor. I use Levels Health, which is a CGM company that develops an app that where the, the data from the bio wearable, it could be the Abbott Libre device or the Dexcom G6 goes into the app and shows you your glycemic response to meals. And it can identify, it becomes like an AI system that could basically if you put the information in, tell you when you've worked out, it starts to understand your diet and gives you a metabolic score. So having that metabolic awareness to understand when you're, a lot of people have no idea what their glucose does when they're eating. And it's hard to do if you're trying to prick your finger and time it. But if, if you wear a continuous glucose monitor for even two to four weeks, that'll give you so much insight into how your nutrition is affecting your body. Yeah. And that's going to be super important. But the basic things, your blood pressure, your fasting insulin, which is not done on a routine exam. Right. So I use a ZRT uh, cardio metabolic kit, which looks at insulin. It looks at HSCRP, high sensitivity C-reactive protein, uh, hemoglobin A1C. Like a lot of these times, these things are not on routine exams. And insulin should be because you could actually have normal glucose control. But as we age and we become insulin resistant, and Ben Bickman has written about this, and I, I think great. he was on your podcast too. Yeah. yeah. So basically what happens is that you start pumping out more and more and more insulin over time to where, and you can plot this out in non-human primate studies, which my colleague has, has done this. But your glucose stays the same, your fasting glucose, but you require three to four times more insulin. Your pancreatic beta cells are pumping out more insulin to keep that glucose in that range. You wouldn't know this, that you're going down the path of no return to become type 2 diabetes if you don't measure fasting insulin. So, you know... Uh, you know, Genova Diagnostics has tests, ZRT, there's different tests. And I we use a test that's like basically just blood spot. You put like six to 12 spots of blood on a card, and then it goes and analyzes the same sort of methodology that Quest Labs or LabCorp would do. Uh, but you can do it in your home. You, it's a kit and you send it in. So I think in addition to your CBC and CMP, just your general blood work, your blood pressure, body composition, and then another biomarker would be like a functional biomarker, like just being able to do ideally like 40 or 50 push-ups, right? So if you 
take someone and, you know, for some people it could just be walking 10 minutes. That could be a major goal. But if, if you're capable of doing, you know, 20 pushups now, and then you can do 30 or 40 pushups, that's going to translate into increased longevity, increased, I mean, there's so many, and I call that like a functional biomarker. So there's body composition, and then there's physiological biomarkers, there's biochemical biomarkers, but it's a constellation of all these things together that are going to be super important for your overall energy, which will translate to productivity, which will translate into longevity. I mean, I could go really deep into other things that we do on psychological testing, on mood, general anxiety, the GAD7 test, PHQ9. We wear different bio, bio wearables like the Aura Ring or the Whoop Strap and look at heart rate variability and sleep. So sleep is super important. I was a mouth breather when I was sleeping. So I've been taping my mouth. I talked to James Nestor years ago and he was writing his book. And then he was at our conference too. I'm really... Because... I did my PhD on respiratory neurobiology. I've always been interested in, in breathing. Tape my mouth when I when I sleep, and if I'm doing cardio, try to just really focus on nasal breathing uh, for that. And then, you know, I'm guilty. I have not been doing cardio, and cardio really sets the base. Your recovery between sets and things like that. I noticed. I invited some guys over, pretty you, you know tough guys working out with and I could train and lift really heavy, but my recovery, I was just like huffing and puffing between sets. And I was like, man, I do farm work, but I'm not getting, I really need to start doing hit. So my wife bought me uh, like an assault bike or it's a Schwinn uh, Airdyne, like the newer Schwinn Airdyne. So it's like, man, I really got to start upping my cardio game. That's the big thing lacking in my life right now. Uh, as far as a health standpoint, my cardio base is not very good. So you, you need a wing in the house, Tom. What are you doing? <laughs> I'd sprint with the dogs and stuff sometimes. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. So you, it sounds like you guys spend a ton of time on kind of the biochemical aspect. I'm curious if you're looking at kind of the frequency aspect of the cells, like the bioelectricity and, and looking at, at voltage and things like that and as far as in implication and in cellular optimization. Yeah. So my PhD research was actually doing patch clamp electrophysiology. Wow. So that is actually you take an electrode and you stick it onto a neuron mm -hmm. and then you measure the membrane potential in response to different environments and things like that. So I am very interested in redox, what's called redox biochemistry. Our cells are like little batteries, right? So our cells have a membrane potential and the membrane potential is you can calculate it with like the Nernst equation and the Goldman equation. This is what I teach to the med students. But that membrane potential, the electrical potential within a cell, is actually a consequence of ATP production. There's a sodium potassium ATPase that maintains that membrane potential. You know, realize this even when I was an undergrad, I started doing patch clamp electrophysiology, is that the membrane potential starts to become de-energized when the energy when the bioelectric uh, status of the cell decreases. So that's it's all about giving the cell the proper metabolites, substrate for energy production, uh, decreasing ROS production, making sure the cofactors are there. Like, you know, B vitamins, B12, B, you know, another thing to look at is to do a nutritional status, you know, and I always recommend not only vitamin D, magnesium, and uh, but also various B vitamins, B12, B1. If these things are not there, the bioenergetic state of the cell and the electrical potential of the cell will be dysregulated. So we look at this. I mean, this is kind of what we do. We do use different dyes to look at membrane potential in the mitochondria and membrane potential in the cell. And then we figure out what disrupts it. And then we develop countermeasures that we ultimately move to humans to preserve that. So one of my early observations was that, and I looked at lactate, uh, alpha L polylactate, which is a product Cytomax that like I, when I was into mountain biking, I used to drink. And so I got into that and in different forms of glucose. But when I stumbled across ketones and started delivering ketones in different concentrations, I realized that I could preserve the mitochondria and the cellular membrane potential, even under really high levels of stress. So that could be dumping on glutamate, which is an excitotoxin high pressure oxygen, 
different environmental chemicals and things that would typically disrupt the cellular energy. The cells were much more resilient if they were burning ketones as an energy source. So this, I did not have an interest in ketones, but it just, it was one of the things that I studied at the time in 2007 or eight, I guess, that led me down the path of the ketogenic diet. And I only knew it of, of a diet that was used in extreme bodybuilding for cutting, but it was like far from optimal. But I started researching and I was like, whoa, it's an anti-seizure diet. So then I went down that rabbit hole of the ketogenic diet. So when it comes to the electrical bioenergetic state of the cell, the things that I have researched that really had a high yield effect was basically, you know, burning ketones, you know, and, and I did it from a Petri dish, you know, we had hippocampal neurons and we had cortex neurons. And then that, got basically, you know, translated into looking at brain tissue and then mice and then rats and then ultimately humans. How often and when are you using ketone supplements now, Dom? This morning, like when I wake up, I'll take third of a packet of Keto Start, which is like by Audacious Nutrition. It's like really concentrated electrolytes. Ketone salts, but, right? Yeah, yeah. And the salt blend, most ketone salts on the market basically just give me diarrhea. <laughs> It's really bad. Like pretty yeah. much all of them do. There's a formulation that there's a product that I really like called Element. Rob Wolf makes it. It's like yep. electrolyte. Yeah. So the Keto Star uses the that ratio of electrolytes, but it binds beta hydroxybutyrate to the electrolytes. So you're giving the electrolytes, and then you're giving you know ketones at the same time. Uh, so I'll take I'll do a third of the packet in the morning with like creatine and acetyl L-carnitine. So I'll mix that together. And then I drink that and just with water. So it's really no calories. And then I go out like this morning, I let the cows out. I walk around barefoot. I get a lot of bright sun as the sun's coming up. And then I jump in the pool and swim a couple laps. And then I come in and start brewing my coffee and getting my workstation, getting things up, <laughs> up and running. So that's like my normal routine. And then I'll take the rest of the packet around like two o'clock in the afternoon, and then I'll mix that up and then it'll just give me a second, a second wind. If I'm hiking or doing like extreme stuff, when I lived in the undersea environment for 10 days underwater, I was consuming a lot of exogenous ketones and looking at the effects on oxidative markers and things like that. So yeah, I'm a big fan of, you know, I have, I have a whole bunch of <laughs> ketones around the office behind me. So we have like probably... 30 or more molecules. I mean, most of my research has been on ketone esters, but then as I progressed, then I realized that I was kind of not very favorable from you uh, taking a big load of sodium. And then I realized that sodium is actually like one of, like a performing, performance enhancing substance. And I kind of load on sodium before I go train, especially in Florida. So the ketone salt is actually perfect because I'm getting my electrolytes like element, but delivering beta hydroxybutyrate, which is like really a nootropic. So I think of, I experiment with a lot of different nootropics and I find that beta hydroxybutyrate is probably up there with the top and you're, it's not a stimulant, although if you use like keto start that has caffeine in it, then there's a, a definitely a synergy between ketones and caffeine that have been you know studied and reported on. So that's something that I use also if I'm writing and I just need a lot of cognitive you know energy. Not really a difference in efficacy with the salts versus the esters. Well, with the esters, you have to be sort of careful because uh, esters are more potent, and we're using them in some of our. It depends on the context of what you're using it for. So, an ester will boost your ketones above two millimolar, up to three and four. What happens when you boost your ketone levels to two millimolar is that you start pumping out insulin. Mm. So, and then that's how we actually regulate ketones. When we go on a ketogenic diet, our ketones become elevated and then we pee out ketones. That's called ketonuria. And then as the ketones get elevated, the ketones will then stimulate the pancreas to release a little bit of insulin and that decreases fat oxidation in the liver, beta oxidation of fatty acids in the liver. So, you know, that the insulin, as Ben Bickman <laughs> talked about, the insulin will shut off the fat burning process, which is not good if you're using ketones for recomp. If you're consuming ketone esters and getting above two millimolar, then you're shutting off your fat burning process as evidenced by the decrease in ketones production. So if so, the bottom line is that if you take a ketone supplement and you're shooting above two millimolar, maybe even 1.5, then you're decreasing fatty acid oxidation by virtue of 
releasing insulin and you're also decreasing ketone production. And then what happens, like if you're on a standard diet and you take a, and I've done this many, many times, I've taken more ketone esters than anybody on the planet. I was doing this back in, back in like 2008 before anyone knew what ketone esters were. I had Patrick Arnold making some, actually, he'd be a good guy to have on your podcast. You know, I'd love Patrick, to connect with him. Not, yeah. I don't know, man. I'd love to meet him. Yeah. He was making stuff for me and I was consuming it, you know, uh, and so what happens if you're on a standard diet and you take a big dose of ketone ester and you shoot up to like five millimolar, you definitely feel like euphoric and wired, but then your ketones go up and then your ketones go down and it prevents your body from making ketones if you take a big dose. And then you're hypoketotic and hypoglycemic because you released insulin. It basically facilitates glucose uh, disposal in tissue, the insulin does. And then you get a headache after. So I kept getting these headaches. I would consume a lot and then I'd have like energy, but then I would get a headache. Then I started doing a lot of blood work. Patrick started making ketone salts for me. And we were like, the only ketone salt on the market was sodium beta hydroxybutyrate. And then we were like, hey, why don't we just take other electrolytes and start making? So Patrick was doing this in the lab. He was sending it to me. I was consuming it, doing blood work. And we realized that the ultimate approach would really be electrolyte supplement that would deliver the ketones. So you're getting like a twofer. So, right. And then the, the electrolytes, basically the mineral load that you get kind of prevents you from going above 1.5 to 2 millimolar. So every time I've measured insulin and as many times I've measured insulin with a maximum tolerable dose of a ketone salt. And it's like, it's, it barely moves the needle. So I can get quite a lot of ketones in my system with a ketone salt and the taste is way better. It actually tastes pretty good. And uh, the Keto Start product does. It tastes pretty good. And then it gets my ketones to where I feel it. It delivers the electrolytes. I'm not dumping insulin. It's not shutting off my own ketone production. So these are what I use sort of on a daily basis for my you know workout. I'll take that two thirds of a pack with some creatine before I go working out. Although for like different you know, for cancer, for different like glucose transporter deficiency syndrome, like rare metabolic diseases and certain forms of epilepsy. I think the, the ketone esters may have more potential there because you just want to get the levels high and keep it high to manage certain serious medical disorders. So I think of like ketone esters, they're always going to taste bad. They're pr probably always going to be kind of expensive. They're great for medical applications, but you can get a lot of like 90 to 80% of the ketone benefits from the ketone salts, and then actually avoid some of the side effects, the hyperinsulinemia that could be a, a result of the ketone esters. So it sounds like you're doing about one meal a day, you're doing the ketones in the morning and that too, and then larger dinner? Or you yeah, have meals I in the actually, I, you know, I used to do intermittent fasting, but I was losing too much weight. <laughs> So, you know, I, I cruised along at like 230, 225, 230 for many years, but now I'm down to like 210. And I think I'm at a good, just like weight for my body. But if I do intermittent fasting more, I just tend to lose weight. So I do, I do the ketones in the morning with a lot of water. I drink a lot of water and I do the ketones with uh, acetyl L carnitine. Carnitine is a, a good fat burner and a good uh, with the creatine. And then I go outside, do my thing. And then, yeah, I eat, I eat breakfast like an hour or two when my wife wakes up, usually about two hours later, like we have breakfast and it's like a keto breakfast. And then, uh, and then I eat a small protein rich lunch, usually like sardines or a little bit of chicken or something, but just a small amount. And then my biggest meal is probably uh, dinner where I eat probably about 50% of my calories kind of at dinner, but we've been trying to eat it a little bit early because I don't like to eat, disrupt my sleep at night. So I get a lot of calories in around like five to like six yep. and then just kind of coast uh, and just nibble at nighttime a little bit with like some berries or just like a little keto ice cream or something at nighttime. But I try to not what's disrupt a, what's my What's a keto sleep. breakfast look like? Still, we're, we're on the same page. I'm just curious if, if I'm doing it right. What's the keto breakfast look like for you? So this morning, actually I had from last night, we cooked scallops for dinner. So I had uh, like 10 eggs, but just two yolks because I gave the yolks to my dogs and I put in some scallops and I cooked it in uh, in olive oil. And uh, so it was really high in protein, not super high in fat. It was like high protein, moderate fat, essentially no carbs. Let's see if I have, yeah, for lunch, yeah, I have sardines. 
So wild planet, sardines. Uh, Man, I heard you sold out like Whole Foods around the country when you spoke about that on Tim Ferriss. Is that true? I, that's what I heard. Actually, yeah, we <laughs> talked to the company that was, you know, and I, I experiment. I don't always have Wild Planet. We probably have like five different, you know, we could probably have like five different brands of sardines and mackerel at the house. Yeah. But, you know, I eat a lot of beef, but I noticed that when I started decreasing my beef consumption and adding more, batting back in more like chicken and fish, my LDL went down. And I don't know the atherogenic risk of having a very high LDL on a ketogenic diet, which gets a lot of attention, probably more attention than it should be getting, <laughs> you know, these days. Uh, but mine was was really elevated. And I brought it down to the upper range of normal just by incorporating, switching out less fatty. I was eating, you know, a lot of fatty ground meat and kind of phasing that out and just getting more fish and more chicken. Uh, I still eat beef quite often, but we get beef from like a local, you know, grass fed, grass finished. And maybe that makes a difference too with bringing it down. But uh, the day before that I had liver and uh, chicken liver. So my, my wife uh, grew up eating a lot of liver in Hungary, in Budapest, Hungary. So I have liver a couple times a month. You know, we have that mostly chicken liver and chicken hearts. So I think tonight we had, she had falling out chicken hearts. So we eat a lot of beef liver, chicken liver, hearts, a lot of heart, a lot of all different kinds of fish and quite a lot of beef. Uh, we give our dogs everything that we eat, our dogs eat too. So we have two dogs and- That's awesome. Uh, <laughs> we have sheep. One final question. So you mentioned that you're you're experimenting with a lot of nootropics and obviously you said MCT and ketones and basic substrates like B vitamins, magnesium. But is there any other things that you've been experimenting with that you found great efficacy with? If you don't mind sharing. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, there's different things that I've been testing. Actually, uh, I'm a consultant for a company that makes uh, this product is really good. So I've been really into mushrooms. Me too. So there's a company, uh, First Person. I would tell people, check it out. So they have three products. Uh, one is the first product you take in the morning and it has, it basically boosts your dopamine. So it's, a, you know, it has like, Cordyceps, it's it's got L tyrosine, it's got lion's mane, uh yucca purins and panax ginseng, cordyceps militaris extract, cooperzine A, maybe I mentioned that. So it's basically there's three products. One I'll take in the morning, and that'll give you a pulse of dopamine. And you'll start feeling that. And it's basically like head down, get shit done, get work done. Yep. And then they have a product that you take like in the afternoon. That one's called Golden Hour. And it's got basically, it's like focus and chill. And it's got a, a mix of mushrooms, other interesting ingredients, including a, a tiny dose of lithium in there. So I don't know how they navigate that, but uh, there's a... It's, these it's legal to have really a small cool. amount in there. I think if it's under oh, three okay. milligrams, it's legal. Oh, okay. So it's got that in there. And then the nighttime formula, which I have not, I don't use that often, but I use occasionally if I need to get to bed early, is Moonlight, Moonlight product. So this is what I've been sort of experimenting with and I've, you know, helped back and forth on the formulations. And so uh, the Moonlight product has holy basil, it's got L-theanine, kava, passion flower, a couple mushroom uh, components too that have sort of an adaptogenic relaxing effects. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of potential in mushrooms and we can go down that scenario. But I've been talking with, I visited a mushroom farm recently. Well, first person, they're growing all their, their lion's mane, their, uh, their cordyceps, their reishi and everything. So it was really cool to see how that production happens from the ground up and the quality control. It's like pharmaceutical grade control. There's like steps to even getting into the lab and then autoclave. So, and that was out in, uh, in Seattle, Washington, sort of the mushroom capital. We have, and just walking on the property too. There was a lots of mushrooms. Yeah, all that's over. great. We have an amazing um, sponsor for the podcast, Real Mushrooms, and I've been using them for probably five years and it's the highest quality I can find. And there's other companies out there, but nobody's compared, but yeah. I definitely will check out First Person. I'm a massive fan. Like I use mushrooms literally yeah. every day in, in many different ways. Yeah, yeah. I'm becoming a believer. You know, uh, I've been sampling different things. <laughs> You know, over the years and, and realized that there's a lot of potential here. I mean, this is truly like food is medicine kind of things. Yeah. Even from a culinary perspective, I was always interested in mushrooms. But yeah, the bioactive component. Actually, I was just talking with sort of people in space research and NASA and they're, jet, they're 
you know, developing a regenerative agricultural system and mushrooms are a big part of that. So yeah. mushrooms, mushrooms will be going to space too. So the, the mushroom conversation is super interesting. And, uh, and I think it's not, I mean, we're just at the cusp of it now. I think there's so many applications to functional mushrooms. I know you're a fan of uh, measuring your HRV. I don't know if you've used Reishi specifically for HRV, but I see a huge bump in um, probably two to three grams before bed. If I, if I'm going to improve, well, if I'm looking to improve my deep sleep and my HRV, it's a pretty consistent bump, like across all my clients and myself. Reishi is in the, the moonlight product. So yeah. that, that's very interesting. So I've been using this very intermittently. Like if I need to get to bed early and stuff, and I do notice I wear different sleep monitors, uh, a Fitbit and then the aura ring too. I do notice more deep sleep. Yeah. Yep. I, so, I mean, three grams of reishi before bed, I see a good bump in HRV. Obviously, I, I go through experimental times of like overtraining and overreaching and then trying to recover. And HRV is one of those consistent things I just see working kind of across the board. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Reishi is one of those things I see working across the board. Yeah. yeah reishi and yep. the reishi effect on HRV. So, that's yep. really interesting. So, I'm going to start paying attention. Dom, I know, man, I'll be respectful of your time. Um, every time you come on, it's just, it's awesome. I'm sure we could talk for hours. I need to make it into the lab if I ever. Yeah. Uh, get invited. I'd be happy to get down there and uh, we'll make it happen, man. I'd love to work uh, or just be a, be a fly on the wall or support you guys in any way we can. Um, is there a way that our audience can support you, Don? Do you have a Patreon? Does the lab have some way where people can make um, donations to the lab? Because I think people listening, you can make $100, $1,000 donation to the lab, support you in some of this amazing research. I'd love to uh, be able to contribute and ultimately direct our audience to be able to contribute to your lab. Well, Ben, I really appreciate that. Yeah, I think, you know, I try not to ask for money. That kind of feels weird. But I think you could support just by sharing, you know, sharing the podcast, listeners out there, obviously that. And then uh, my website, it's more of an educational website. I don't really sell any personal products, don't have it, but uh, ketonutrition.org. So all one word, ketonutrition.org. Uh, we do, I do have a website set up for some of the consulting stuff we do with the, like with the space research and things like that. So I'm always looking for, I'm actually very much looking for commercial partners that would be interested in, on, are interested in getting their product or their device onto commercial spaceflight mission. So if there's anybody out there that are interested in maybe, you know, getting their company logo on a rocket or a spaceship that, that's going to go for space research, uh, and then using their product too, or using their biowearable device or something like that on space missions. I am working with groups that are sort of organizing that. So uh, we do on keto, ketone technologies.com is a website that I have set up for consulting and more like research that we do with USF and outside USF. And I think there's a link to the USF foundation on there. Uh, and that link the money that goes is a 501c3 and that money is under tight control and that that is only used for like student research projects on metabolism you know uh metabolic psychiatry uh is something i've been very interested in so using nutrition to treat depression using yeah. nutrition to treat bipolar disorder so there was a had a very cool conference the metabolic psychiatry roadmap it was in, this is just the mug from the conference yeah. uh, where we got together as a group of academics and clinicians and talked about the role of nutrition and metabolism on brain function and it has profound effects on depression, anxiety, like PTSD. So it's a very, this topic is emerging and now the NIH is actually funding some research. And I'm and very you're, interested. You're preaching to the choir on that, Tom. I, I, I know you don't have any kids yet, but like one of my passions is, is my children and ultimately children in general. And I was metabolically broken as a child because I just ate so poorly. I, my, my lifestyle was terrible. And so I'm so aware of the implications. And so I'm, you know, I don't say I'm neurotic, but I'm pretty, um, you know, highly aware, let's say with my kids and like, I want to make sure they're metabolically healthy, you know, just to avoid things like that. I think it's, it's something we can avoid in these young adults who are experiencing panic disorders and anxieties and depressions. Like, can it all be eliminated? Who knows? But certainly a lot of them can, in my opinion. So I love that you guys are doing this. And if there's a place where I can go watch, I don't know if you guys filmed it or if you're going to sell the, the webinar and like that, if it's on YouTube, I would love to uh, be a part of that and, and understand what's going on. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for asking. So as a co-host for MetabolicHealthSummit.com, so we had speakers on there, uh, Shabani Sethi from uh, Stanford. So yep. she actually coined the term metabolic psychiatry. So her talk is on there. Dr. Chris uh, Palmer, who would be awesome guy to have on. He's at Harvard Medical School, and I'm sure he does he does podcasts too. He was a speaker, talked about the mitochondria and metabolic health and psychiatry. So he treats schizophrenia and bipolar but he gave a talk, but he also brought on a patient that had like, she was obese. She had untreated like bipolar. That was crazy. And uh, this, t- this talk is actually available on Metabolic Health Summit website. You can download, we had a virtual component, so you can actually see all the talks. You can get CME credits and CEUs for it. So all that's downloadable on the virtual platform. That's metabolichealthsummit.com. And we had quite a few speakers on metabolic psychiatry that were just kind of mind blowing. And it kind of, you know, really, we want to elevate this mission more and make that a bigger part of the Metabolic Health Summit, which we'll probably have in Tampa 2023. Probably we're organizing that right now uh, to give more attention to brain health and psychiatry and in regards to using nutrition and metabolic approaches for psychiatry. Yeah, but that website, uh, metabolichealthsummit.com, all that virtual, the virtual platform will give you all the talks. I, I presume there'd be someone talking about the benefits of exercise to metabolic well or to, to cognitive well being, right? Was there somebody at the, that seminar or that summit that spoke on that? Absolutely. Yeah. Tommy Wood talked about that. So he's, uh, he's out there in, in Seattle too. And, and he gave a talk about basically using exercise that muscle. So muscle is not only like our metabolic engine, but muscle creates hormones and cytokines like myokines and there's you know, IL-6 and things like that. So muscle is an endocrine organ yep. that is like super important for our mental health, our overall metabolic health. Uh, we had Dr. Colin Champ. So who is a, uh, um, uh, you know, a radiation oncologist, but he is actually spearheading exercise oncology. So there's a whole Hmm. field being developed right now using exercise to mitigate cancer cachexia and how the the huge effects that he has in his patients, just employing a very well-designed exercise protocol to, for, for outcomes. Like it's dramatically improving outcomes as you would imagine, but it's not, you know, it's not so much on the NCI or NIH radar to do research uh, so much on exercise, but it's showing new data, new projects that are emerging and new science showing that if you exercise and do a well-designed exercise, pro- it's reducing chemo brain, it's reducing the side effects from, from drugs, and it's just augmenting our metabolism in ways that decrease cancer growth, for one thing. It can be obviously a preventative too, but less research is being done on that. Tom, I'm incredibly grateful for you as a human and for everything you do, man. Thank you for making the time to join us today. Thanks for having me, Ben. Appreciate it. Great to be on as always. Thanks, man. All right, ladies and gents, thank you very much. That's a wrap for today's episode. Dominic D'Agostino is truly a brilliant wealth of information. Dom, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here on the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I don't take your attention lightly. I do my best to always bring the best guests, ask the best questions, do my research. So we're ultimately giving you the most cutting edge information to help you solve your health, fitness, and muscle building problems. Muscle Intelligence is constantly growing and expanding to support your journey. Muscleintelligence.com slash learn, L-E-A-R-N. If you want to pick up a listener guide for each episode, get extended show notes, additional links, other resources at absolutely no cost to you uh, because we want to support you guys and ultimately living your greatest life in the body you love. Special shout out to our sponsors, Organifi, organifi.com slash muscle to get you hooked up with 20% off. Ladies and gents, don't miss out. Organifi is truly a great product. If you haven't tried it, go. If you already tried it, go get some more because you know it's delicious. And that's why they continue to sponsor us because our listeners take action on living their greatest life with the highest quality ingredients. I don't know about you, but I'm neurotic about what goes into my body. I care about what goes into my body and so should you. This is becoming my tissues. I want to be around for a long time. I want to feel great. I want to perform well. I want to look like a champion all the time. And another way we can do that is supporting our friends over at Buy Optimizer, B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S. Particularly my favorite product they have, two of my favorite products. Mag Breakthrough is just amazing. 
And Masszymes is another product that I just don't live without. If I'm consuming a high amount of meat, which I'm about to go consume, I'm going to throw in about four to five Masszymes with the meal. And sometimes I'll even take it between meals or in the morning to bring down systemic inflammation. If you're someone who wants to look great, feel great, perform at your best, use the code MUSCLETAN at checkout. Ladies and gents, thank you very much for being here. As always, live your greatest life in a body that you absolutely love. Thank you so much for tuning into Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Bikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.